How do you explain? How do you describe? A love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide. You know all our hopes, but you know all our fears. And words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that soars from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine And if I had a thousand years, Lord, I would still run out of time If you listen, listen to my heart, every beat will say Thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, thank you for the way so listen to our heart, oh Lord, please listen, hear our spirit sing, a song of praise, a song of praise, from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. So listen to our heart, oh, Lord, please listen, hear our spirit sing, a song of praise that soars from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. Good morning. Welcome to Southwest. <laughs> Sorry we're not here to shake your hand. Have a great day. Love Miss you. Miss you. Miss you. Hello, Southwest. I hope we can meet together soon. We love you. I sure miss everybody. Hey, Southwest. Let's let you know that we sure miss being with all you guys. And we also want you to know to stay safe. God bless you. Hello, guys. It's Don and Linda. And we miss you very much. And we our prayers are with you and may, may bless all of us to get back together soon. We love, love you guys. We miss you. We miss you so much. We miss you, church family. We miss all of your beautiful faces. See you soon. Bye. Hey, guys, I miss everybody so much. I can hardly wait to get back together. Can't wait to be with our Southwest family again. We miss you guys a lot. Love you. Hugs. Love you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We miss you. We miss y'all. miss y'all. Uh, 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 we, we're missing singing with the praise team. And we wanted to keep our voices strong, so we're singing with the herd. Congratulations to the graduates of our church, and I just pray that you will soar like the balloon.
Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you chose to join us this morning for our online worship service. So glad that you and your family or you and your house uh, can join us, at least in, in some kind of way, uh, to worship the Father this morning. I, I love seeing those videos that we've had for the last couple of weeks of all of our church family waving and, and saying hello and that kind of thing. And uh, I want to thank Ryan and Kyle and Craig for putting all that together and making it where we can see each other at least and smile when we see each other. And thank you, Cheryl. Uh, that was her idea. Uh, she sent that idea and we got to put that together. So thank you for all uh, that are putting that together. And thank you for all of you that were on video and said hi to us. Uh, we, we love seeing each other. So our normal is changing, it seems like, every day or every week recently. Uh, what is uh, allowed and what is uh, expected of us as both citizens in our towns or, and as a church. And this week was no different as uh, the Texas governor uh, re reduced some res restrictions for our businesses and allowing some of our businesses to open uh, at least at some capacity this week uh, and re uh, uh, lessen some of our restrictions uh, for our churches also. At the same time, our city authorities, our local authorities in Amarillo, are advising us to continue to stay home and to continue to stay, uh, wear masks as our numbers are continuing to rise uh, pretty drastically here in our city. So with that, for now, uh, and, and weighing the uh, guidelines that the governor gave us for meeting if we meet as a church, such as staying six feet, of, feet apart, uh, wearing masks, skipping every other row, uh, protecting our most vulnerable and that kind of thing. We have decided that for now, uh, we are going to continue this online practice of worship in our homes. Uh, for the coming week, we're going to continue to have our office closed, uh, to continue staying at home with our office and uh, employees and working uh, from our homes. But we are developing plans uh, that those things may change over the coming weeks. Of course, they will be changing over the coming weeks. Uh, it will be slow. Uh, we'll move into this slowly with, with grace and with patience and with love for our community. And so as those plans develop and as we decide to make some changes, uh, we will be communicating this to you through email, uh, on our website, uh, in our videos that come out in the middle of the week on Wednesdays, on our Friday 5 email, and on our Sunday announcements. So make sure you're checking there. And of course, you can always call us or email us and ask us what's going on, and we'll be glad to tell you what we're planning for the future. But that will be, like I said, that will move in phases, uh, and it will move slowly uh, to where we will someday be back as a congregation fully, having Bible classes, able to greet each other normally. Uh, but until we get to there, for today, we're worshiping online together. Keep checking our website and our midweek updates. So you may be asking, what can we do now? And as we said in our midweek update, when we ask the mayor, uh, what, what can our church community, what can the body of Christ be doing for our city? She simply said, choose to wear masks. And so we are encouraging our church to choose to wear masks. Show love to your community by wearing masks. And I know that it feels ridiculous many times to wear a mask into a store or into the post office and you might be one of only two or three wearing it uh, but i also know that most true acts of love feel kind of ridiculous when you're doing them and sacrificial love feels kind of ridiculous so we will be christ-like in this and we encourage you to be christ-like in this and wear a mask if you don't have a mask or if you can't get a mask uh, we encourage you to well, first be creative, get a bandana or a handkerchief or an uh, old t-shirt and wrap it around your face. It's, it's not anything that has to be uh, technical or anything, but we do have some friends in our church that are making them. Uh, you can email us at churchmail at southwest.org and we'll see if we can get one to help you. So uh, a couple things. One of our, our makers, Donna, she's made, she's made, she's <coughs> told me she made over 149 uh, mask already and she's given all of those out uh, but a few so far but she is telling us that she is in need of quarter inch elastic and iron on pellon that's quarter inch elastic and iron on pellon 
And I don't even know what iron-on pedal-on is, but I know some of you out there do. And I know some of you out there have it in your homes and you're not doing anything with it and you can donate it uh, to the ones that are making these masks for us. So if you can do that, because they're out at the stores, you can't buy it right now. If you can donate that, please email us at churchmail at southwest.org and let us know that you have that. Or if you're making them, please email us at churchmail at southwest.org so we know uh, that where our supply might be coming from. All right. We always love to celebrate our family anniversaries, uh, especially publicly we celebrate anniversaries over 50 years. And this week, uh, actually tomorrow, Al and Jeannie Sternenberg celebrate 52 years of marriage. That's on May 4th. Uh, they celebrate 52 years of marriage. So send them a card or a note and love on them. They're a great, great couple. What a great family. And finally, our seniors. We, we don't want to forget our seniors. Uh, today, as many of you know, is supposed to be Senior Sunday. Uh, we were supposed to be honoring our, I think there's about 20 seniors. Uh, we were supposed to be honoring them uh, and blessing them today as they are, uh, the class of 2020 is graduating. Uh, tonight was supposed to be our junior senior banquet where we celebrate our seniors and their families. And while we can't do that now, we do plan on honoring them and blessing them down the road when we're able to, uh, maybe closer to their, their uh, graduation dates, their, their ceremony dates, if we're able to do those but we don't want you to forget them now. Uh, so in the bulletin, you can go online, go to the member section and look at the bulletin. There's a list of our seniors and let's just bless them as a church. Uh, bless these students who've, who've had a lot of loss, a lot of loss of last things in their, uh, in their school career, in their high school career. So let's bless them, don't forget those seniors. I know that was a lot, I know that was a lot of announcements. Uh, so let's now get into our worship. Uh, we just sang together, Listen to Our Hearts. It's one of my favorite songs to sing as a church at Southwest. It's, it's one of those songs that the church seems to love to sing, and we, we sing out loud. And, and I want to remind us this morning that we are not called in Scripture to sing well. Now, some do, uh, but some don't, and that's okay. We are called to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And, and the psalmist says, make a joyful noise. Then he says, make a loud noise. Uh, so in your homes today, I encourage you, to make a loud noise, sing out to God, express your love to Him today. Uh, no one will be a, around you to judge you except for your own family, and they've heard you sing before. So sing out this morning, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Remember to pause when you need to, and remember, check your posture. Don't consume, but lean in and worship. Now let's worship together. Good morning, church family. Uh, I'll be reading out of Psalms uh, 145. Verses 1 Why through 14. Yeah, buddy. I will exalt you, my, ki my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends, commends your works uh, to another. They tell you, they tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. <laughs> so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your, domin er, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all and lifts up all who are bowed down. I will call upon the I will call upon the who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth and thus be the rock and let the God of my salvation be. Exalted, the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock. 
Hark, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Jesus Christ died for me. Jesus Christ died for me. And he took away my sin. And he took away my sin. I will live with him I for will eternity. I live with him for eternity. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the I will call upon the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, O oh my soul O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before O oh my soul I worship Your holy time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship your holy name. I worship your Good morning, church. I'm going to be reading Psalm 71, verses 1 through 8. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. I have become a sign to many. You are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy veil, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all the and before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, the nations rise and fall, kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love, in justice you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Good morning, church. We're the Scots, and this morning Trey is going to read Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what will you wear is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reef or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can anyone of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers in the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his 
Splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is run into fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pigeons run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Lord, you Hello, church family, and good morning. In modern culture, we often see masses of people, sometimes paying outrageous sums of money, full of excitement and jubilance to see sporting events, concerts, world-renowned speakers, popes, the Dalai Lamas, prime ministers, and even presidents. And I begin to wonder, do we have the same excitement and desire to be in the presence of our king? And if not, why? So I want to give our hearts a direction for our worship, and particularly this time of remembrance. Let's talk about kingdom for a moment. It is one of the great Bible themes. From King David to King Herod, from the curious story of King Melchizedek in Genesis, to the final story of the King of Kings in Revelation. The entire Bible is a story of kings and kingdoms. Now, many of those kingdoms have come and gone, but there is one kingdom that will stand forever and ever. Ultimately, the Bible is a story of God's kingdom. And this is the gospel, the good news. In Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus says, The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Matthew, in his gospel, chapter 4, verse 23, tells us that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And in Luke 4, 43, Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. But one of the prerequisites of having a kingdom, even the kingdom of God, is that there must be a king. If you're following along in our 2020 Bible Project, we have been reading about the rise and fall of the early kings in Jewish and our history. King Saul and now King David, who has just risen to serve as king over united Israel. But we now have an eternal king who has risen to an eternal throne and he has not or will not fall. His name is Jesus and he reigns in this kingdom. We begin to see this from Jesus' infancy. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, Jesus, after Jesus was born, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Later, we see Philip bringing Nathanael to Jesus 
And Nathanael makes the proclamation in John 1 49, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And near the end of Jesus's life, Pilate questions him and asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And without denying the claim, Jesus replied, you have said so. And afterwards, they placed a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe on him and mocked him as a king. So rather than a grandiose inauguration full of excitement and galas and fancy balls, Jesus' coronation as king was that the Son of God was raised up on a cross and nailed there, where he died taking our sin and shame and was buried. But the story doesn't end there, praise God. Jesus rose from the grave and later ascended to heaven, where the Hebrew writer in chapter 12 and verse 2 states, We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he has endured the cross, scorning its sin and shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we can and are living in his kingdom even today. This is why we want to be here. Overwhelmed with joy to be with our King. Therefore, as we enter this time of communion, let us approach the table of remembrance with the understanding that we are in the presence of our King. And He has invited us to dine with Him by participating in the remembrance of His death, burial, and resurrection by the breaking of bread, which represents His body, and the drinking of the fruit of the vine which represents his shed and covering blood. We remember this, his coronation, so that we can remain assured that Jesus is alive and reigning as our king. So as you enter this time of remembrance, here are a couple questions to discuss amongst your family or others who are gathered with you. Or if you're alone, feel free to call any of your leaders or, or the ministry staff or other individuals that you trust and discuss these questions. Number one, do you have an overwhelming joy and desire to be with your king? Why or why not? And then question number two, if Jesus is truly the king of your life, what in my life might I need to change or strengthen? Have a good day. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Let the glory of your name passion of the church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us only son of god sent from heaven hope and mercy at the cross you are everything you're the promise jesus you are all to us let the glory of your name be the passion of the church let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us. When this passing world is over, we will see.
Jesus, you are all to us. Hello, Southwest Church family, and welcome to you and to anyone and everyone else that's joining us for our current version of our weekly worship gatherings. This isn't our first choice in how we would prefer to gather. This isn't the kind of expression we're used to. And I, and I joined so many of you that have told me you're just really longing for the day when we can get back together in some shared space and worship together and learn together face to face. I join you in that. But I do hope that you are looking for the good in what we're doing, even though it's not our first choice and it's been forced on us. And even more important that you're looking for God and what he might be trying to put us on the fast track to learn and to add to our skill set in our commission of making disciples. And, and that's making disciples of ourselves and our own spiritual growth, of our kids and of the world. And I hope, I hope you're doing that because this change, while we didn't choose it, it is forcing us to learn new things. And I hope you're looking for some of those new things that God might be trying to teach us and train us in during this time. For example, I was reminded of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 5. The book of Acts is the record. It's some of our first records of the first church and the description of how they gathered. And both those places say overtly that they continued to meet in the temple courts, which would have been larger group gatherings, but also house to house, which would have been smaller group meetings. Very often, just family units and family groups. And so we are kind of being forced to learn how to bring worship house to house. Most of us that have grown up Christian in particular, we have a lifetime of being committed to the temple court gathering. And now we're being forced to learn how to bring that worship, how to bring that spiritual growth, how to bring that spiritual feeding and spiritual agenda into our homes. And so I hope you're allowing God, even though we didn't choose these circumstances, you're allowing him to redeem them. And that's just the big churchy word that means taking something bad and turning it into something good or useful for his kingdom. So this past week, we began a brand new book of the Bible as a part of our ongoing Southwest 2020 Bible Project, which is this awesome Bible reading, video watching plan that our church family has been going through together for the year. And any of you can join us at any time. The schedule for that plan, very doable, attainable schedule, is right here on this website. You can find it and you can join us at any time. And speaking of the 2020 Bible Project plan, and speaking of bringing spiritual activity into our homes, our children's minister, Rachel Patterson, she sent me a video this week of something cool that's happening in the Matt and Mitzi Wade household. Okay, so our friends, Matt and Mitzi, they are doing the Bible Project and they're doing it together with their sweet daughter, Maddie, who decided that she wanted to start quizzing her parents on that week's Bible reading, okay? And, and just hold their feet to the fire on whether they're reading or not, I guess. And so. Uh, Mitzi took a video of one of these times and I called Maddie after I saw it and asked her if I could share it with all of you so that uh, we could all just be encouraged at seeing one picture of how the project can make it into our homes and how spiritual life can make it into our homes. So enjoy this. What did David, David's servants do to... Uh... I don't know who that was, the guy. Ashbin? Yeah. Ishbashi? Yeah, yeah. Ash what's, what's yeah. his name? They killed him in his bed. Yes. And they cut off his head. Yeah. Took the head to David. Yeah, that was disgusting. Yeah. What chapter was that? I think that was chapter 4. Yeah. Four. Uh -huh. Are you sure? Yeah. That's all I got. Okay. That's really good. What chapter are we in, Maddie? What book? Uh, Saul. Second Saul. Why did I call Saul? Because we've been reading about Saul. So I had Mitzi ask Maddie where she got the idea to get up in front of her parents and give her that little quiz on what they've read. And she said it came from a mixture of pictures in her head of her 
her school teachers, but get this, also her Bible class teacher that helps her spiritually. And I asked Rachel, and that's Wendy Camp. And so that just, ah, oh, that just made me so grateful for you, Wendy, and all of the women and men that uh, help us uh, just make disciples of our children. And so while my point in showing you the video primarily was to uh, promote the idea that we need to be spiritually responsible for fueling each other's and in particular our children's spiritual growth in our homes. The background story to that still brings to light of how grateful we are and should be for how we help each other when we gather together as family. So summary, while we're not gathering in our large group, yes, it's healthy to miss it and to long for it, but it is also healthy for us to look for God in it to grow and to learn everything we can from it. Now, before I get into this week's teaching, I wanted to remind you of why we're doing the 2020 Bible Project uh, originally anyway, especially for those who've joined us later this year and have joined us in this Bible Project. So while it's always, I believe, it's always a good idea to, to read your Bible and to grow in knowledge of what's in there, there are right and wrong ways to do it, literally. Uh, contrary to what we wish was true, the Bible is a complicated book. As an example, the Bible's not even a book, okay? We've learned that the Bible is 66 different books written by over 40 different authors from all different stations and walks of life in three different ancient languages and at least a dozen different genres, okay? So how you approach Scripture dictates what you will end up leaving scripture with. So if we want to read the Bible in a way that unlocks what God intends for us to get from it, we need to read it in the way that God intends us to read it. So this last fall, we actually did as a church family, we did a, a series on the Bible, not what's in the Bible like we're doing now, but on the subject of the Bible. We were real creative in titling this series. It's called The Bible real creative. So anyway, in that series, we explored two questions, okay? We wanted to know, what's the stated purpose of the Bible in the Bible? And second, what lenses do we need to use to read the Bible in order to unleash what it intends to unleash on the world, including in us? So the short answer to those questions is the purpose of the Bible, the whole reason it exists, is to point each of us and the whole world to life in and like Jesus Christ. That's the purpose the Bible was written. So if you read it for any other purpose, you're misreading it. That's the purpose of Scripture. And so the lenses through which we need to read the Bible to unlock and unleash that purpose are the lenses of love, the lens of wisdom, and the lens of story. Okay, now that's a brief answer on what we're doing here and why we're reading the Bible is to practice reading it with those lenses in service of that purpose. Now, for a more extensive explanation or reminder, I summarized that whole fall series that we did on the Bible in one message that I delivered on November 10th, 2019. And it was entitled, The Biblical Way to Read the Bible. Okay, now I'm telling you that because you can find that teaching on this website as well. Under teachings, you can look it up by the date, you can look it up by the series, and you can find it. So i uh, love for you to, to, to review that if you need to, or if this is a new thought to you. I think it might change your life in how you approach Scripture and, um, and align you with what God wants you to have Scripture for. Okay, so this past week, we began a brand new book of the Bible the book of 2 Samuel. Now, you might be interested to know you actually didn't begin a new book, even if you did, because the books of 1 and 2 Samuel were actually one long story that someone along the way decided it was convenient to divide it into two chunks, and they decided the death of Saul was the, where they would end the book of 1 Samuel. So I just thought that was interesting. So the story in these two books record a major transition in the story of God among his people. So the 10,000 foot view is this is the beginning of this transition 
for the people of God, they're named Israel. So it's a transition from them being this loose-knit group of 12 separate tribes that lived in the Holy Land and the transition into a kingdom where they would be unified under the authority of a king. So zoom in a little bit closer, maybe the 5,000 foot view. That transition is told to us through the stories of three main characters. The character of Samuel, who's considered the last judge from the book of Judges, and the first prophet who speaks to the nation uh, on behalf of God. Um, so that's Samuel, and it moves to the first king, King Saul, and the second king, which is King David. And that's, that's what we're reading now in the book of 2 Samuel. So if you zoom in on the second half of 1 Samuel, it starts recording the ascent of David and the fall of Saul because Saul decided he wanted to serve himself more than he wanted to serve God. And David is identified as this man after God's own heart who will become the, the true king of Israel. So 2 Samuel begins with the continued rise of David to the throne. So if you're current, you know that the chapters we read involves David being crowned by all 12 tribes. David then captures the city of Jerusalem, which will become a central place uh, in the rest of the biblical narrative, and even still is today in a lot of ways. And then uh, he also, after he takes over Jerusalem and moves in, it becomes the city of David, but then he goes and gets the Ark of God that's being stored in Shiloh with the remnants of the priesthood of Israel, and he moves them and it into Jerusalem. So the city of David now has become the city of God as well. And then we have some stories that Israel finally has arrived and they get some rest. They get some um, relief from the nations that oppressed them. The first time in their history since they left Egypt in slavery, uh, this is the first time they've gotten some relief from oppression. And there's some stories of the expansion of the kingdom by King David in his God-favored leadership. So, what part to cover this week? I wanted to draw your attention to the contrast between King Saul and King David. Now, I'm doing it for a reason. I counted in between the books of First and Second Samuel, 23 chapters, 23 chapters of scripture are dedicated to this game of thrones that's going on between King Saul and King David. So, to compare it, when we get to first and second kings where we're going from king to king to king in very quick succession, okay? The transitions are noted with one or two verses typically, okay? No detail, but in this transition from Saul to David, 23 chapters, that's that's more than, than the average of, of the whole story of Jesus in the four gospels. I think they average 22 chapters each. And so this is a lot of scripture. Why is that? It's almost like the narrative wants us to see the difference between Saul and David. Why it was so important for Saul to go out and for David to come in. There are dozens of stories and overt commentary explaining the difference. So uh, that, there's a bunch in 1 Samuel. I'd love to cover like um, how Saul tried to kill David inappropriately right? Many times he was looking for opportunities to kill him, to maintain power. Compare that, David had the opportunity to probably justifiably kill Saul, who was trying to kill him, and take the power that God had already granted him, but he wouldn't. So there's a contrast there. Even Saul's family, his son Jonathan, his daughter Michael, 1 Samuel says they both loved David. And when it came down to a choice between supporting their household with Saul, who wanted to kill their friend David, they sided with David behind their dad's back. They would help save his life. I, I could go on and on in what's in 1 Samuel, but we're in 2 Samuel, and in chapter 3, there's this notation, okay, that sets this contrast. It says, the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Now, you might, if, if you're keeping up, you might ask the question, how in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel is the house of Saul and the house of David still at war? Saul's been dead for three chapters. How is it? Well, Saul's cousin, Abner, who I haven't mentioned to you yet, but you've read about him, he was this strong 
and mighty leader. Saul's cousin, but he was also his muscle and his right-hand man politically. He was also the general of the mighty army of Saul, which was the army of the nation of Israel. And so he held a lot of power. And when Saul died, now you might not have known this, but when Saul died, there were two kings then crowned in Israel. Did you know this? So here's what happened. Saul dies, and here was David's approach after Saul dies to what comes next. First, it says uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 2 that I won't read it word for word. It's a little lengthy, but David inquired of God. He inquired of the Lord for what to do next, for where to go next. And then when God told him what to do and where to go, he initiated, he used his initiative and strength by responding to God's will and going. He, he specifically told to go to the city of Hebron, okay? Then it says, when he gets there with his family, the people of Judah, that's one of the tribes, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Judah, which is David's tribe, they come to Hebron and they anoint David king, okay? Still, David's not grasping power. He is submitting to God and he is submitting to the people, okay? This is a man of strength and action, but he is submitted to partnership with God and partnership with the community that he serves and will lead. Now, in contrast to that, in the second part of this chapter two, here's what Abner does, okay? And I'll read it to you, it's short. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, brought him over to Mahanaim, he made him king over all Israel. Okay, so here's the climax of the comparison between the house of Saul and the house of David that I want you to use for some personal evaluation, okay? David's kingship begins with a humble partnership with God and people, okay? He's, he's still a man of action, a man that's going to get things done, but how he gets things done is by inquiring of God and in cooperation with the community, okay? In contrast to that, Abner is, uh, he, the, look at the harsh verbs here. He took Ishbosheth. He brought him to that city. He makes him king. The harsh verbs make it clear that they're trying to make a contrast here. Abner's authority is being utilized here. He is making a king because, uh, from his brute strength that stems from his political and military power, okay? And so that's what we have in contrast here. Now, where am I going with all this? We live in a culture, starting back in the frontier days of America to the Wild West and all the way up to today, we live in a culture that exalts strength and rugged individualism and personal power and the ability to get things done, oftentimes, no matter how we do it, okay? Like a person who gets things done, typically we see as an individually strong person who has learned how to manipulate or be an authoritarian and make things happen from a position of strength, worldly strength. And that's a pretty good description of the household of Saul that's being painted in scripture. The culture we're in is, is what's being painted by the culture of the household of Saul. So as Christians, we're not to act like that, right? We're supposed to stand in contrast and like a light on a hill, we're supposed to shine in the culture that we live in. We're supposed to get things done, sure, but how we get things done is supposed to be more like how David got things done in willing submission and partnership to God's leadership and communal approval right? We're supposed to do that. And we even see the great com command there of loving God and loving others. How we get things done is a lot different than what's exalted in our world. So with that contrast, I want to leave you with an assignment and a question to do together in your household, okay? Remember how all scripture points to Jesus? Well, I have a verse for you. It's in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. I want you to go there and I want you to read that together. So we've been studying today um, David and his way being exalted in contrast to Saul's way. Well, here, Jesus is overtly, Jesus, by the way, is called the son of David, okay? He's the son of this story that this is pointing 
forward to, which is really interesting. Matthew mentions him as the son of David 10 times, and he's mentioned as the son of God only eight times, okay? So this title and this connection to the story is very cool, but that's for another time. Uh, so I want you to read this, those verses where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the culture they live in and how they're not supposed to be like that. They're supposed to operate differently. So I want you to read that and I want you to discuss that, both in how it relates to the story we looked at in David's time and against Saul and how it relates to the culture we live in now and how we're supposed to live as Christians. Then I want you to discuss, just very honestly and transparently, which way do you find yourself operating? Which way do you find yourself operating? More in the typical brute strength, kind of push it through, do it through your own strength way, getting things done, and or in a more submissive to God and in cooperation with the people around. I want you to talk about that, how you're doing in your household, which is really important right now. Okay, while we are confined to our households, how are you operating? This could really improve that if we submit to it, but not just there, in your classrooms, in your workplace, in all of the places where you get things done. Do you operate more like the household of David or more like the household of Saul? Now, may the Holy Spirit come into your rooms. May he come among you and work through you and shape you to, to transition you, just like we're reading here in scripture, let him transition you from the house of Saul and its ways to the house of David and God's ways. In our lingo, may God's Holy Spirit make you more like Christ. I love you. God bless you.